Thank you to everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here again in the HRI conference, one of the most interesting conferences in, about homeopathy. And today I'd like to talk something about homeopathy and environmental challenges and some results related to this theme. Okay. So homeopathy is clearly beyond medicine because we have many examples of using homeopathy in agro-homeopathy or in <coughs> veterinary uh, practice and uh, in other utilizations. For example, we have in Brazil different groups of research about homeopathy and sustainable agriculture. Uh, this is a, a first case in Santa Catarina state, in the south of the country. We have the State University of Santa Catarina at the city of Lages, where Professor Pedro Boff is a leader of a group of research about uh, sustainable agriculture and uh, the use of homeopathy in this context. Also, in the south of Brazil, in another state, Paraná, we have the State University of Maringa, in which Professor Carlos Bonato, uh, he does a very interesting work because besides the science and the publication of articles and experimental studies with plants, he also uh, uh, is a leader of a social um, project in which uh, small farmers that live around Maringa city are oriented by him and his team uh, to use homeopathy in their little farms. So uh, with this social work, they could uh, improve the quality of life of these little farmers and uh, improve the income of these families. Uh, but also, there are private institutions in Brazil that are uh, able to incentivate large areas using of homeopathy. For example, we have two cases, uh, one of uh, a organic coffee culture in Sao Paulo and an organic Guarana culture in Amazonas, where the uh, institutions are uh, organizing studies. And uh, it's always with large areas of um, production of this product. And on the other side, we have also uh, some big companies in Brazil that are uh, working on uh, homeopathy for cattle and in large extensive breeding. So in Brazil, we have huge farms with many, many, many uh, uh, bovines, uh, mainly uh, for meat production, and using homeopathy prepared in mineral salt, and this mineral salt is uh, offered to the animals as a free access basis. And with this, uh, they can improve the zo zootechnical uh, index of uh, these properties, like weight gain and uh, reducing stress of the animals, and improving quality of uh, life of these animals and also the quality of the meat produced. So all of this means uh, sustainability because there is no chemical residues uh, in the food. There's the possibility of an harmonic integration between farms and forest, so it's more ecological than other systems. Uh, with high productivity of food, but also with high nutritional quality. And uh, beso besides it, uh, there is a possibility of control of epidemic situations. So this is perfect. What a wonderful world. <laughs> but there are still punctual initiatives about this approach. It's not hegemonic, not yet at least. But now, today, we, have, we still have a big challenge to manage. Today's reality is quite different. Uh, we have very large scale production, 
with high dependency of agrochemicals. This is true. This is our reality. But it's not easy to solve because there is an economic and social cost dilemma around this issue. Plus, the environmental pollution, that's clear, and it's a big trouble. Um, with the persistence of some products in different levels of food chain. This is may, maybe the more critical point of this, this, the, the, the whole trouble. But how homeopathy can help in this case today? So we tried to study something about, and we, started, we decided to study some experimental results. Uh, me and my group, we work with basic research. So uh, you'd like to give some contribution in this, in this subject. You decided to study using a model uh, called Artemia Salina. This is our experimental model nowadays. Artemia Salina is a microcrustacean. And it's uh, very interesting to be used as a model because it's easy to be developed in laboratory conditions from the seed form to the adult form. This cycle, this li the life cycle of this animal is very fast, so it's easy to handle. Uh, Artemia salina is a biosensor in toxicology and even in ecotoxicology, and it's in the bottom of the food chain. So if there is any kind of intoxication here, uh, it can be magnified alongside the the, all the, the food chain, and uh, it can give a big impact to the animals that, that are in the top of the, the, the food chain. And also, there is a bioethics um, advantage using this model. This is a good alternative model to replace mammals, mice, rodents. Uh, and it's also easy, very easy to handle in laboratory. We can put the cysts to, to be um, eclosed in bottles used for cell culture, for example, adapted to the system, or in culture plates. For example, here we have a 96-well plate in which we can put the cysts and can see and observe all the development of the, the nauplia, the larvae stage, up to the adult phase. We can uh, have many parameters to be analyzed using this very simple system, using a little magnifier, digital magnifier, and you can see this image in the computer, and it's easy to, to organize the, the data. So our first study was about the glyphosate, and we uh, used this model in, in which glyphosate was uh, use it to intoxicate uh, Artemia salina, and they are treated with the own isotherapic. This study was performed by my PhD student, Miriam Nagai. That's here. So glyphosate is an herbicide. Uh, the main mechanism is uh, the inhibition of the enzyme responsible for the synthesis of essential amino acids uh, in plants, of course. Uh, but uh, Intoxication of this product may, may create a difficult situation because there is a probable uh, endocrine disruption after chronic intoxication. And this is the, 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 main, the more, most difficult, difficult issue to study because in, uh, in chronic intoxication, uh, even low concentrations uh, but constant exposure of this product uh, can cause some troubles, and it's not easy to see, it's not easy to quantify it. But it's, an, uh, of course, an environmental problem uh, that must be solved. So we decided to organize our model according to this idea. You use it, uh, the CL10 concentration, concentration, so it's the concentration able to kill 10% of the Artemia salina in a certain uh, environment. Uh, and we could find that 0.02% was this, our CL10 in our model. We performed all the experiments blind and we uh, analyzed uh, three parameters. 
eclosion rates of the cysts, morphological features of uh, the naupli, the larva, and the naupli behavior. And here you can see some results. Uh, regarding to the behavior, uh, we used a very simple test in which naupli, 10 naupli are put are, uh, into a tube, a transparent tube, and graduated, containing seawater. And uh, we know uh, that uh, healthy naupli are able to swim near to the surface of the water column. And the sick and ill naupli uh, trend to swim in the bottle of this uh, tube. So we can count after a while, a while, in this case after 72 hours, we can count the number of naupli swimming in the surface and swimming in the bottom. It's very, very simple. And here we have the, 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 the results. Uh, this, in this first column, we can see the negative control. It means uh, naupli that are living by themselves in the water without contamination and without treatment, any treatment. It's the nat natural situation. But after different treatments, uh, with the control, uh, dynamized water, or uh, the vehicle uh, that is uh, ethylic on one CH, that means it's hydroalcoholic uh, hydro uh, solution, diluted in water and succussed. And three potencies of glyphosate, the isotherapy of glyphosate, 6, 30, and 200 CH. It, it, there are some interesting things here, because uh, with dynamized water, our control, we only see the effect of intoxication. Uh, all of these treated groups were intoxicated and treated at, at the same time. And the effect of intoxication is very clear here, and very clear after 30 and 200 CH. So both potencies were not, were not effective in this case. But if 6 CH, we could see uh, an inversion of the effect. So we could see more naupli swimming in the surface than in the bottle. And after the treatment with vehicle, we could see the, the same pattern of the negative control. So the, the vehicle itself was uh, useful to help uh, to protect the, the naupli. Uh, from the intoxication, but with 6 CH, the result was better. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, there, there was a statistical significance here. <coughs> and also, uh, including uh, the analysis of eclosion rate, we could see that in the baselines, that means the, the, the negative control, the now plea that were not intoxicated, not uh, treated with anything. Here we can see that we could find after the closure two naupli per 100 microliters of water. And after the exposure uh, to glyphosate, the, this number was reduced to about, about 50%, one naupli per uh, 100 microliters. But after the treatment with glyphosate 200 CH and glyphosate 6 CH, uh, this reduction was even, even uh, most important and statistically, signif statistically significant regarding to the other groups. So there is a kind of potentiation in this case regarding to the eclosion, um, the, reduce, the reduction in the eclosion rate. Uh, when we st studied the morphology, we classified the uh, naupli in different uh, patterns, N the normal pattern uh, or defected uh, naupli, uh, for example, lacking one antenula or lacking both uh, ante antennulas uh, or no antenna or no head. These two uh, defects were the most uh, uh, frequent in this case. We analyzed 711 naupli and after this analysis, we uh, observed the proportion between healthy and affected uh, larva. And we could see that after treatment with glyphosate 6CH and 30CH, uh, 
we could see a higher number of healthy uh, animals than the other groups. So as our conclusion, uh, we could uh, understand these results as a selective effect of glyphosate 6CH, because 6CH was the only potency able to change all the parameters analyzed. Uh, it is a, we think that's a good environmental impact of using glyphosate 6CH, because it was able to reduce the eclosion rate under aggressive condi conditions. And for Artemia salina, it, it's very critical because cysts are the res resistant form of this animal. If the environment is not good, they remain like this, like a cyst. So it's a kind of protection. The, the, the cysts can be viable for decades or even centuries. It's already in the literature. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing related to this species. But uh, the Nopli that were actually born presented healthy behavior and healthy morphology. So our next step is to observe if the isotherapy can be uh, also effective in higher concentrations of glyphosate, for example, CL30 or CL50. So this is our next step. Let's see what's going to happen. And in another uh, set of experiments, uh, we tried uh, to do the same thing, but using mercury chloride instead of glyphosate. It's much more toxic substance. And even uh, doing uh, the same procedure, we uh, also analyzed the influence of moon phase in uh, the action of this, the, the isotherapy and also in the action of the intoxicant itself. Because Artemia salina is a marine organism and uh, maybe it can be susceptible to uh, long uh, moon, phase, uh, moon phases va uh, variation. And here we can see the first result. We have the fourth uh, moon phases during the, the, the whole set of experiments. And in fact, uh, in the full moon, in the third quarter moon, there is a higher level of cyst eclosion, independent of the treatment, but it's nat natural, it's a natural uh, rhythm of uh, Artemia salina. In this study, we used uh, 700 cysts per treatment, and we did nine plates or nine repetitions per moon phase. So at the final of the experiment, we had uh, almost 2,000 uh, Naupli analyzed. And we used it mixed way ANOVA to combine ev all the uh, parameters uh, after the Turkey to analyze uh, uh, ooh, as the post test, to analyze two, two by two. And all, of course, all the study was performed blind. And here we have another result. Uh, we did the interaction, statistical interaction between moon treatment and time, and there was uh, no statistical interaction among these three parameters. But in the, in the graph, we can see that in full moon, in the third quarter moon, if compared with the first quarter and the new moon, the natural way of uh, eclosion of Artemia salina. So we, if we observe only the first group, that is the unchallenged group, not intoxicated and uh, uh, not uh, treated with anything. In these two phases, uh, after 24 hours, here in the, bl in the blue line, after 24 hours, almost 100% uh, almost of the seeds were ar already eclosed. So the effect of the treatment and, and the intoxication uh, could be more clear uh, after 24 hours than uh, after 48 hours when everybody was already clothed. And uh, in the first quarter in the new moon, the rate of eclosion was very small regarding to the full moon and the third quarter moon. So this, this is a natural 
uh, oscillation of Artemia salina physiology, but uh, according to this, uh, this variation, there are some uh, moments where the difference can be clear, more clear than in other moments. However, uh, when we performed uh, the statistical analysis there, uh, regarding to the interaction between treatment and moon, there was no statistical difference. That means that independent of the moon phase, the effect of the treatment and uh, the contamination uh, it, uh, didn't change. So the, fung may, the, the, uh, the moon phase is not able to change the treatment. It's able to change the Artemia salina physiology, but not the treatment itself. We, we can see different levels of eclosion according, according to the, f the moon phase, but the uh, effect of the treatment was uh, more or less the same independent of the moon. But when we, we compare treatment and time, uh, here we could see statistical interaction because after 24 hours, it was uh, easier to see the differences between contamination and non, uh, not contam contaminated artemia and uh, the effects of the treatment itself. And when we look the whole thing and we, and we join the, the whole da data in, uh, in the same analysis, we could see that mercury chloride 30 CH was the most effective because it was different from both controls, water and succussate water, and it was, di was also different from the unchallenged control. And all the treated groups, that means all the, con all the, the, the uh, NAOPLI that were uh, intoxicated, presented, of course, a reduction uh, in the uh, NAOPLI eclosion. But it was even more evident, statistically evident, in uh, 30CH, mercury chloride 30CH treated Artemia salina. So it's the same uh, result seen in uh, the study performed with glyphosate, for example. It seems to be something universal, maybe. Let's see. We are trying with other substances. Let's see in the future what we can, we can uh, conclude. So here we can see that moon, the moon phase has a very important influence in cyst eclosion, but it was not enough to change the effect of treatments. Uh, in full moon and third quarter moon, the eclosion happens earlier, so uh, the intoxication itself induced a certain delay in eclosion, and it, wa it was more evident in after 24 hours. But a significant and specific delay was seen only after the treatment with mercury chloride 30 CH. Why specific? Because it was different in relation to both controls, water, and uh, uh, it was independent of the moon phase. So in another moment, uh, in another set of experiments completely different from, from the former, we uh, started to study the uh, usefulness of solvatochromic dyes and the properties of water uh, trying to understand better our biological results. And you could uh, count on the help of Stephen Cartwright and uh, another colleague, Ivana Sufredini. In our first experiment, performed by another student, Renata Palombo, we compared antimonium crudum in different potencies using three different uh, dyes. And uh, in methylene violet, or BDN, or ET33, we could see that, uh, that higher uh, dilutions, uh, 200 CH, in this case 230 CH, of antimonium crudum uh, was different from the control that was succussed water. So this seems interesting because we had something in, in our hands, uh, a good tool to, to be used. In another experiment, uh, performed by Hannah Mott, another student, uh, we analyzed the supernatant of cell cultures of macrophages <laughs> infected with Leishmania amazonensis and treated with different potencies of antimonium crudum. 
And these supernatants were frozen during a while, and then they are thawed and prepared as uh, one CH in pure water. And this one CH was immersed into the dye and analyzed in the spect photometer. And uh, it's important to, to mention that uh, these super supernatants were in contact with cells previously treated with antimonium crudum, but not uh, contained the, the remedy itself. But this supernatant in contact with the cells previ previously treated presented a higher significant difference be, uh, comparing to the controls uh, using methylene violet. The controls here uh, is uh, supernatant from macrophages alone, supernatant from macrophages infected with leishmania but without treatment, and supernatant of, of macrophages infected with leishmania and treated with succussed water. And all these controls were different from the real uh, treated uh, cells. It was amazing, amazing result. So this, this can be very useful. So sovatochromic dyes are useful tools to identify physical markers in water, probably deep hole moment perturbation, but this is, there is still a discussion about. But there is a correspondence between homeopathic medicines and biological echo samples this in, in this imprint. So it can be very useful for other approaches. And uh, finally, we performed a field study using phosphorus 30 CH uh, with the help of two colleagues, two veterinarian uh, colleagues uh, that were, were in charge to treat monkeys uh, with a problem of yellow fever. But we had a very large outbreak of yellow fever last year in Brazil. And these two uh, uh, veterinarians were uh, in charge to treat monkeys of certain proper, uh, property. One of these uh, veterinarians, Sideli, who is <laughs> following me in, in the session, and the other, uh, Dr. Sonia. And uh, uh, both decided to use an, another method to offer the medicine to the animals, to, uh, uh, to the animals in a big area. Uh, with a uh, very large number of animals, is they use the natural water source as a vehicle. This method was developed by another colleague, another veterinarian, Monica Souza. If you put the, the, the medicine in the natural source water, the water flow itself is able to uh, um, uh, spread the, inform the homeopathic information to all the animals that drink this, this uh, this, uh, this water. And uh, our doubt is, uh, how can I know if this information can really reach long distance uh, using this method? So we organized something like this. This is a scheme of the property uh, where there are different lakes. Here, one lake uh, in the upper side of the, the property. Uh, it's an independent lake, not linked to the other lakes uh, of the property. Here we have the source, a fjord, a, a first lake and a second lake, all linked in, this, in the same water flow. And the phosphorus 3rd CH was put here, was poured here in the source. And before and after different times in dif and in different points of the, the property, uh, they uh, harvested water samples, and these water samples were prepared in our laboratory. Uh, they were filtered twice to transform them in uh, stereo water. Then it was succussed 1 to 200 uh, in pure water, pure, pure and stereo water, and added to methylene violet to see them in the spect photometry. And this is the result. We analyzed the medicine itself, the phosphor 30CH, and it uh, responded very, very well to methylene violet. Here we can see both controls and methylene violet, so it was okay. The medicine uh, had a very clear sign of using this method. And when we analyzed the water samples before and di in different times after the treatment, in different points, we could see that in the source, 
uh, before the treatment, uh, the absorbance of methylene violet is here, and we had a significant increase of uh, the absorbance of this, uh, this dye after different times, up to 72 hours after the treatment. Uh, in the fjord, it was the same thing, but after 22 hours, the cyanol disappeared. In the lake one, the same thing, but a little bit later, after four hours, uh, the first cyanol appeared. In the lake two, the uh, profile was similar to the fjord. So uh, up to 72 hours, you could identify a cyanol of, in this water, uh, using methylene violet. And the most interesting result, I think it's here, the independent lake, not linked to the water flow, was completely, uh, had presented nothing, no result at all. It's, uh, it, it was our control lake and uh, validating the, the other results. Um, so, just to finish, uh, the, our intention wa was to analyze water. Dot. But of course, we are curious about the treatment of the monkeys. And uh, Sideli and Sonia told us that after the treatment, because before the treatment, they, have, they had 32 monkeys in the property, and all of them were killed by yellow fever between December 2017 and February two, uh, 2018. But after the treatment in May, uh, to, uh, 2018, uh, four, uh, four months after, uh, new monkeys appeared in the area, in the area and in October uh, 2018, repro reproduction begins because Sonia could uh, make uh, this uh, snapshot of a little mummy monkey carrying uh, her baby uh, on, her, on her back. So uh, reproduction is a very important, very significant biological sign of, because if animals are, uh, are uh, free to reproduce themselves, that means that the environment is okay. So it's not, of course, there's not a statistical uh, analysis, uh, it's not a quantitative analysis of this, of this uh, result, but uh, it's, a good, it's a good news. To, to know that uh, something happened there, and we could see the, the, the sign in the water using solatochromic dyes. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.